I want to thank you for your presence with us at our gospel service this uh, Sabbath evening. Uh, we're glad to see each one that has been able to join with us. The hymn 219 is our opening hymn uh, for the gospel service tonight. A ruler once came to Jesus by night to ask him the way of salvation and light. The master made answer in words true and plain, ye must be born again. 219, please, and we'll stand uh, together as we sing. promise of your word. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. We're thankful for the opportunity to be able to call upon thee in the place of prayer. We recognize, Father, the great blessing that you've bestowed upon us. We're conscious that we can only approach thee in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's only by the value of his precious blood. Lord, we recognize our need. We need thee to guide us. We need thee to teach us. Like your disciples of long ago, we would want to call out and ask that you would teach us uh, to pray. Come by your Spirit, Father, and work in our hearts. 
We pray that you'd give us a greater desire uh, to seek thee in prayer. Give us greater power at the throne of heavenly grace. We want to pray, Father, that not just personally and individually, but even as a band of your people collectively, as a congregation, we would know thee, Father, pouring out your power and pouring out your Spirit uh, upon us. And Lord, we would ask that you'll fulfill that great promise of your word for us in these days, that as we would call upon thee, that you would answer us, that we would see answers to our prayers in our own lives, in our own service for God, in our own homes and families. We pray, Father, that we would witness the answer prayer uh, for our loved ones, especially those that are careless of the things of God. Lord, we want to ask that we will see the answer prayer even for the work of God, the testimony of the gospel in this church and in this congregation. We want to pray, Father, that even as that verse says, that you'll do great and mighty things uh, for us as a congregation. We pray that we'll witness great answers to our prayers. We pray that we'll witness and experience the mighty power of God coming upon us, even in great blessing. We want to ask, Father, for our land, uh, that you will answer our prayers. Our, our land, Father, is in great need at this time, especially uh, spiritually. We thank, Father, of the barrenness of our land in the days in which we're found. Uh, we thank, Father, just of uh, the lack of interest that there is in the days in which we're found in the Word of God, the preaching of your Word, the proclamation of the Gospel. We think of the apathy towards uh, the house of God and even uh, the keeping of the Sabbath day. And Lord, we want to pray that you'll be gracious uh, to this land of ours. We want to pray, Father, you'll pour out your Spirit again upon us in all its fullness. You said that you'll pour waters upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. And Lord, we're conscious that those are the days in which uh, we live, the dry ground spiritually is all around us. We need thee to pour out the floods. And Lord, we're thirsty uh, today for your blessing. We're thirsty for a, a greater knowledge uh, of your word, a greater understanding of the truths of the scriptures. We thank you for the Bible. What a blessing, Father, uh, that you've uh, given to us. Uh, we want to pray, Father, deep in our love uh, for the book of God. The scriptures, one of old, could declare that the, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Lord, we pray that that will be true of, of our hearts and our experience, that this book uh, that we hold in our hands that was given to us at such great price. Uh, we pray, Father, that it will be our most treasured uh, possession. We want to ask, Father, that we'll, we'll read it daily, that we'll study it, meditate upon it. Your word says of the blessed man in the first psalm that his delight was in the law of the Lord. Father, we pray that we'll have no greater delight in this world and in this life than our reading and our studying and our meditation of the Scriptures. Lord, we ask thee to open the book uh, to us. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold great and wondrous things uh, from out of thy law. Lord, we confess uh, the dimness of our sight, how often we read the Scriptures and we do not see the things that we ought. We're conscious, Father, that much of our study of the Scripture is, is shallow uh, at the best, and Lord, we're praying that you'll lead us into the depths uh, of the Word of God. As newborn babes desi desire the sincere milk of the Word, that they may grow thereby. And Lord, we're praying for that greater desire uh, for the Scriptures, a greater desire uh, to read them, a greater desire, Father, to learn uh, from the Book of God. And Lord, most of all, as we look into the Scriptures, we want to see uh, thy well-beloved Son, uh, our Savior. He said, they are they which testify uh, of me. Well, thank you, Father, for a book that primarily is a book about Christ. And Lord, we pray that you'll show us the Savior, show us thyself uh, day by day. We pray that you'll shine by your Spirit upon the pages of thy Word. We remember as the Savior went to Emmaus, we're told that he, he expounded to them in all the Scriptures 
the things concerning himself. And Lord, what, what treasures uh, there is in this book about the Lord Jesus Christ, those uh, spiritual blessings and heavenly uh, places. And Lord, your word speaks about the exceeding greatness of those treasures. And Lord, we want to pray that we would experience a little more of them. Teach us a little more of your word tonight. We thank you too, Father, for all that you've told us in your word about the last days, the end time, those days that will lead up to the coming again of our blessed Savior. We ask, Lord, for help and understanding in our study, even of the prophetic scriptures. And Lord, we think even of the great relevance of them to the days in which we're found. We thank you for the blessed hope that you've given to us as your people, the blessed hope uh, that you've given to the church of Jesus Christ of the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the, the one who is the, the great God and our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. We remember the promise that he said, I will come again. And Lord, we want to ask uh, in the words even of the book of the Revelation, we make it our prayer tonight, even so come, uh, Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask thee, remember our families at this time. Thank you for every family of this congregation, their uh, dedication and faithfulness uh, to the support of the gospel uh, here in Armagh. Bless every family, uh, even at this time. We think, Father, of the days of hardship that we're passing through, the days of uncertainty, we thank Father of the days of challenge finan financially and economically. And Lord, our prayer is that you'll be with our families in these days. Lord, we remember how you provided for your servant Elijah, how, how miraculously when he was at the brook Cherith, the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh again in the evening. We remember, Father, when he went to Zarephath, how that he gave to the widow that promise that the, the barrel of meal and the, oil, and the cruise of oil would not fail until the Lord sent rain again upon the earth. And Lord, we're conscious of many in these days, and, and the barrel, as it were, is very low, the supplies that they have, the resources. But Lord, we want to pray that you'll do the same uh, for your people, be faithful. Uh, we know that you're the faithful God. Great is your faithfulness. May all our families, all of your people, connected with this church at this time, experience uh, the faithful provision of God that you'll continue, Father, even in ways that we cannot anticipate and do not expect, but you'll be pleased to give uh, to your people all that they require. Paul said that you sent once and again unto my necessity. And Lord, those things that are necessary for us uh, to live here below, we pray that you'll bestow them and bless them uh, upon your people, give them every day. Uh, we ask uh, their daily bread. And Lord, grant us, even in these days, in this day of great materialism, when, when men and women are clamoring after more and more of the things of this world, grant to us, Father, a contentment, that rare jewel that the Puritans spoke about of Christian uh, contentment, that having food and raiment uh, therewith to be uh, content. Lord, hear our cries and our prayers, and we ask thee, come now and be with us. We pray that you'll lead us tonight. We rejoice that you'll lead us uh, through life, and we're glad, Father, that we know that you'll come and lead us through this service, even this evening. Here, these are prayers. We offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to read together, please. We're reading in the the Old Testament Scriptures, first of all. We're in the book of Genesis, chapter 11. <clears throat> the book of Genesis in the 11th chapter. We'll read together just the opening section. Genesis 11, verse 1. We'll read the opening nine verses, and then we're going to go over and read a few verses from uh, the New Testament Scriptures as well. So Genesis 11, the first verse. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. 
And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them uh, throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all uh, the earth. And then turning to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, again reading from the first verse. We're going to read the, the first 12 verses of this chapter of the New Testament Scriptures. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. These are verses speaking about the return of Christ. Some details given about the person of the Antichrist. So 2 Thessalonians 2, the first verse. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition." who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivable, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we're closing our scripture reading just there, the end of that 12th verse, and we pray the Lord will add his blessing this evening to this the public reading of his word. We want to thank you on behalf of the session of the church for your presence and your support 
at the gospel service tonight. Uh, we want to welcome all that have been able to join us. Uh, we're thankful to you for your faithfulness and for your fellowship in the work of God, the cause of the gospel here in Armagh. We want to welcome as well all that are joining us by way of uh, the live stream. We're glad that you're able to, to tune into the service, and our prayer is that it might be a blessing to your heart and soul tonight as well. Remember, please, the meetings uh, for, in the will of the Lord for the incoming week. Uh, Wednesday night is our midweek service. That will be conducted by our brother, Mr. Billy McCrum. Uh, we encourage you to come along to the midweek service to hear our brother for the season of prayer. Encourage uh, Billy by your presence. Uh, God willing, I'll be down in Lisburn for the missionary conference, helping out with uh, some matters there. Remember the service is next Lord's Day, that's the 15th of May. The Sunday school and Bible classes at 10.40. Morning worship at half past 11 and the evening uh, gospel service at half past six. And there is the, the season of prayer uh, at six o'clock. We're thankful to all that come faithfully uh, to the season of prayer before the evening meeting. We want to uh, encourage others uh, to come along and to join with us also. In the will of the Lord, I'll be uh, here to preach at both of those services next uh, Sabbath day. Just to highlight again the special mission vision uh, missionary conference down in uh, the Lisburn Church in this incoming week. If you haven't uh, picked up a card uh, with the details, do that as you're going from uh, the service tonight. So the meeting's every night of this uh, incoming week uh, at 8 o'clock. Uh, someone from the board will lead those meetings. Uh, one of the missionaries will give some prayer requests each night. There's also going to be a short video uh, every evening around five or six minutes. Uh, highlighting the various mission fields that our board uh, is currently involved in. And then there's a, a special missionary message uh, that will be brought in all the details of those messages. And uh, the speakers is on the cards. Keep in mind that there's also some uh, missionary workshops on Saturday morning that is open to everyone. There's two in the morning. Uh, the first one of those is at half past ten. Uh, there's tea and coffee, some refreshments at 10 uh, for folk uh, to have a little bit of fellowship before the first workshop begins. So it'll finish at about 25 past 11 then, the first one, a little break of 10 minutes and the second one beginning at 25 to 12. And then there's going to be a, a barbecue at around half past 12 to half past one. And then the, there's to be a question and answer time uh, in the afternoon just to finish off uh, the entire week of special meetings. So I highlight that for you. Uh, the board, the presbytery, has asked all of the churches uh, to announce them and to urge our folk as many as possible to come along uh, to the services. The meetings will be live streamed and it's good to be able to join them that way. Uh, but do, if you can, make your way down to Lisburn uh, to give your support. There's also some uh, boards, displays in the back a hall at Lisburn. Uh, those are for after the meeting. The idea is that everybody will make their way out through the doors beside the pulpit into the Douglas suite and be able to speak with some of the missionaries, some of the representatives of the board uh, each night. Anyone that has any questions, any inquiries about uh, the mission fields, about the missionary work, about missionary service and some literature and other uh, things will be uh, available. So there's a lot of planning has gone into it. The board is very pleased, very excited about this week. Do keep it in your prayers. And uh, we encourage you uh, to, to come along to it as, as many nights as you can. I'm preaching on the Tuesday night. Uh, I've been given uh, the subject for that meeting uh, of the, uh, the role of home church or the home church uh, in uh, missionary uh, work. So do pray for us uh, in the final preparations. Uh, just for that message. Pray we'll know the Lord's help in the delivery of it and the ministering there uh, on Tuesday night. We certainly would value your prayers. Remember that the board has also opened the Facebook page, uh, this time at FP uh, Mission, so do look out for that, and they would appreciate your help in making that as widely known as possible. We're glad that Pastor Patricia Calley uh, from 
uh, Kenya was able to make it here in time just for the first meeting uh, last night. So we're thankful to all that prayed uh, for our brother. And hopefully you'll have an opportunity uh, to meet him if you're down uh, at Lisburn during the week and meet some of uh, the other guests, uh, some of the other missionaries that are uh, present uh, uh, as well. Remember the latest edition of the Vision magazine for May and June is at the doors. Take your copy. There's also a copy of Miss Noreen McAfee's prayer card. We enjoyed our sister's visit, her report and presentation in the service this morning. Do take one of her prayer cards. Uh, she needs your prayers as all her missionaries do. Remember the importance of the covenant uh, support to send a little uh, month by month uh, down to the board office just for our sister's support. Remember the offering uh, for Miss McAfee's support as well. If you didn't have opportunity to give that uh, or give to it this morning, that will be open uh, if, uh, into the incoming week. So don't worry if you haven't been able to give today, you can still do that uh, at a later uh, time. Remember that she'll be here Monday night week again. That's Monday the 16th uh, for the ladies, a special ladies meeting just before uh, the summer break. So we want to remind the ladies of that, encourage you to come along. Uh, she'll, she's going to speak on what we think is a very interesting subject, uh, life in Africa, uh, living in Africa, some of the, the things that are different. She'll tell us some interesting stories, maybe some of the things that we take for granted uh, that they don't have when they're living and uh, laboring there. Remember, we will go to the door after the service. We're going to uh, begin to, to go down to the door uh, again just to greet the congregation as they leave uh, the service at each of uh, the meetings. We want to sympathize with our brother, Mr. David Castles, on the death of his aunt, uh, Mrs. King. We just learned that after the meeting this morning. We apologize that we weren't able to make that announcement in the service this morning, but we want to assure our brother David and the wider family circle of our deepest sympathy and our prayers just at this time of, of great loss uh, for them. Finally, just to remind you uh, that there's going to be a congregational meeting on Wednesday the 1st of June at 8 o'clock in the evening. Uh, the purpose of that meeting is to adopt the two documents that are required for our congregation uh, to register with the Charity Commissioners of Northern Ireland. Uh, that meeting was to be held uh, two years ago, as had been the case for quite a few of our churches. It had to be postponed uh, because of the COVID, but along with the remaining number of our churches that have yet to adopt those documents, we're moving forward uh, to do that just at, at this time. So we'd ask as many of our communicant members as possible to be present uh, that evening. There is a list of the communicant members on the notice board uh, in the porch. We ask you to check that list uh, over the next couple of weeks. Make sure your name is there. Uh, speak to us as soon as possible if you have any queries about that. There will be an information night uh, on Wednesday the 18th. That's Wednesday night week, uh, two weeks before the congregational meeting itself. And the Reverend Brian McClung will come along uh, to the midweek service that night to speak at that meeting. And they'll also make a presentation on why charity registration is uh, needed. As a denomination, we have been registered as a charity basically from the beginning in 1951. He'll explain the changes uh, that is taking place or has taken place in recent years and also what is involved in that charity uh, registration. And on that night, copies of the two documents uh, will be given out so that you'll have opportunity to read them and consider them uh, before the congregational meeting itself. And you'll have opportunity to speak with Mr. McClung that night as well, if you have any queries. And also at that meeting on the 1st of June, uh, we're planning to vote on as property holding trustees, uh, those elders who have not yet been appointed uh, to that uh, position. So we just want to notify you that, give everyone the due notice uh, of that congregational meeting. So please note those two dates and we encourage uh, our members uh, to plan to be present uh, with us. The hymn 151, please, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. 151. Uh, we'll sing together just uh, 
the first and last verses, one and three, and we'll stand to sing, please. McAfee this morning. She was with us uh, this afternoon for lunch, and then she was traveling down to Convoy uh, this evening. So by the time she gets back to Balamoni this evening, she'll nearly have done a full circle uh, of uh, the province. You appreciate the journeys uh, that are involved in deputation. So you remember uh, just our sister in, in uh, your prayers with all of those uh, journeys and all of those uh, travels. Well, just a wee word of prayer together as we come uh, to seek the Lord uh, together. Father, abide with us. We ask of thee, we thank you for the blessing we had in the morning meeting. We thank you for the Lord coming down and being amongst us. Thank you, Father, for the great challenge that there is of uh, the work to be done the souls to be reached. Say not ye, there are four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they're white already, unto harvest. And Lord, we pray for that vision. We pray that that challenge might come home with power to our hearts. We ask thee, Father, to use each of us in the winning of souls. Bless the meetings in Lisburn during this incoming week. We pray that many will attend. We pray, Father, there will be those whose hearts are dealt with in those meetings, just to give their hearts, uh, to give their lives in the service of the Master. We pray that this week there might be a sending forth of laborers. Remember Mr. Douglas, as he will minister tonight on the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We pray that he will know that power, that he will know that experience himself. We ask thee, Father, to remember our brother David Castles and the family circle too at this time of sadness and this time of loss. Pray they'll know your presence. I ask you to draw near. You've promised that even in the valley of the shadow we're to fear no evil, uh, for thou art with us. And Lord, our prayer is that our brother and the family circle will know the Lord's nearness in a very special way. Lord, come amongst us tonight now. We want to sit at your feet like Mary of old. We want to take that special, that hallowed place and listen to your word. And our prayer, Father, is you'll come and open the book of God to us. Answer these are cries in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd ask you to take uh, the scriptures. We're turning together to the book of Genesis. It's the 10th chapter, the one just previous. 
uh, to where we read from just a little earlier. Let me read to you the verses 8 and 9. You notice it says in verse 8 that Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, uh, the mighty hunter before uh, the Lord. So we're thinking together of this man, Nimrod. We started the message two weeks ago. We weren't able to conclude the study in the meeting that night. Uh, we want to do that this evening with the help of God. I emphasize to you at the outset that night that the devil is the master of counterfeit and even has a counterfeit trinity, what must be described as a false and an evil trinity. It's made up of himself to take the place of God the Father, uh, the Antichrist to take the place of the Lord Jesus, and the false prophet uh, to take the place of uh, the Holy uh, Ghost. I, I emphasize to you as well in that service that there are two main ways that we're taught in the Word of God about the Antichrist. One is prophetically. That's by the direct prophetical utterances in both the Old and New Testament Scriptures. But we're also taught about the Antichrist prophetically. can I emphasize uh, to you an important truth that we stated that night. Keep in mind that most men in the Old Testament Scriptures are types and pictures, and they're types and pictures of one of two men, either of Christ, they're either a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, or a picture of uh, the Antichrist. So either a picture of God's Christ or uh, the devil's Christ. And we have been thinking uh, a little about Nimrod. He's not the first foreshadowing in the Bible of the Antichrist. Others like Cain, Cain was the first picture. So others like Cain and Lamech were types of the Antichrist uh, before Nimrod. But this man stands out as one of the first uh, examples of the devil's attempt to raise up uh, a world ruler. Now, we looked at two things in particular uh, two weeks ago. We looked at his uh, personality, and we also looked at that evening at his uh, power. Uh, so there's three other things that I want to deal with this evening, want us to look at and consider. Uh, the first of those is his position. If you think of those words that we read in our text, especially verse 8 of Genesis 10, it says that he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Uh, that word mighty especially, uh, I want to emphasize to you, it's the Hebrew word gabor. It's translated a number of times in the, in the scriptures as chief or chieftain. And what it reveals is that Nimrod is presented in the scriptures as a leader. That is his position. And he's a leader in two significant realms. First of all, Nimrod was a, a leader in the realm of politics, a leader politically. If you look at verse 10 of that 10th chapter, it says, in the beginning of his kingdom, notice the words, his kingdom uh, was Babel. So this man, Nimrod, had a kingdom. Can I remind you, brethren and sisters, that the two great cities of the Bible are Jerusalem and Israel and Babylon and Iraq. And it is around those two cities that the purposes of God in this world will unfold, especially the purposes of God in the events of the end time. It's very interesting. It's an important fact to highlight, to make you aware of. It's interesting that the chapters in the Scripture that deal with Babylon uh, they go in twos. So I want to make you aware of that. I want you to encourage you to look for them as you read and study the Word of God yourself. Here is the first two, the first pair of chapters, Hebrew, or Genesis chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 11. And in these two chapters, you have the beginning of Babylon. These chapters are the first mentions of Babel in the Bible. 
Whereas Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18, two chapters again that go together, the final two about Babel or Babylon, there you have the end of Babylon uh, dealt with. You read there of her doom and you read of her uh, destruction. So keep that in mind. In the Bible, all the chapters dealing with Babylon go in twos. So it's clear that Nimrod was the king of Babylon. He was the first king of this evil city that is notorious. What is Babel or Babylon notorious for? Well, it's notorious for its opposition to God, to the Almighty uh, himself. And I want to highlight for you that the king of Babylon is one of the titles given uh, to the Antichrist in the word of God. Isaiah the prophet said that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. In Daniel 11, it says, And the king, and it's again the king of Babylon there referred to, the king shall do according to his will. So the Antichrist is the king of Babylon as well. But he will be distinguished uh, by the fact that he's the last king of this wicked city. As Nimrod was the first, the Antichrist will be the last a city of uh, Babylon. Notice also that he wanted to establish uh, a world empire. If you look at chapter 10 and verse 10, the two verses that, that follow, we're told that he ruled over eight cities. Let me just read those verses to you. Genesis 10, verse 10, And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Calmly, in the land of Shinar, out of that land went forth Asher, and builded Nineveh, and the city of Rehoboth, and Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. The same is a great uh, city. So Nimrod ruled over eight cities. His kingdom was a confederacy of states. The least is called Rezin, and even it is described as a great city. It also included Erech. Remember what I told you in the scripture reading two weeks ago? Erech is the word from which we get the modern name for Iraq. So as Iraq was preeminent at the beginning, so it will be, men and women, at the time of uh, the end. So I stress to you, as Nimrod was a political leader back at the beginning of history, so the Antichrist will be a great political ruler of the end time, taking full control for a time of the United States of Europe. That will be the final confederacy of nations that this world of ours uh, will know. And that United States of Europe is arising even before our eyes in the days in which uh, we live. But as well as being a leader politically, Nimrod was also a leader spiritually. Remember, the people in Babylon started a building program. They, built, they started a building project. And they built two things in particular. They built a city and a tower. One thing that Babel is known for, perhaps best known for, is its tower. We talk about, we tell the story to our children about the tower of Babel. It's generally believed that they wanted to build the tallest building. In other words, to get into the Guinness Book of Records, it, it would be a building, it is generally believed, it would be so tall that it would reach right to heaven. One of the reasons that it suggested why they wanted to build uh, such a tall edifice or such a tall structure or building was it would save them if there was another universal flood on the earth. But I want to make clear, men and women, that's a mistake. That is all a wrong idea. The people way back then were not as foolish or as daft as that. What is recorded here had them to do with the height of the Tower of Babel. If you notice uh, there the words of uh, the fourth verse of the 11th chapter, it says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Notice the words there in the verse may reach. Notice that the words are in italics. 
That means they were not in the original Scriptures. So we're able to remove those words from the verse, from the text, without doing any harm or damage uh, to the Word of God. So the verse actually says, who's top unto heaven. And there are two ideas, men and women, behind those words, who's top unto heaven. One is that the top of the tower was like the heavens. In other words, it had stars and planets and so on. That's the way that it was finished. It might even have had the designs of the zodiac, the star sign that are so familiar and so often referred to uh, by people today. These were a people way back in Babylon, and they worshipped all the host of heaven. Remember that those words are found and repeated often in the Scriptures. We're told about people that worshipped all the host of heaven. That's what they did at Babylon. And because of this new tower, uh, it was a center of a new religion on the earth. Remember, there are many religions uh, today, but I want to stress that they all have their roots in Babel. I want you to understand that. The Bible says specifically of Babylon that she is the mother of harlots. In other words, she's the mother of all false religions across the earth. How is that? Well, whenever the people were scattered, remember that's what God did as a judgment to them after the Tower of Babel. Whenever the people were scattered, they took their Babylonianism, their Babylonish religion with them to the very ends of the earth. And it continued. They would have added to it, taken bits away from it, depending on where they lived. But the heart of it was still the same, still Babylonianism. So the reality is that all false religion has its origin at Babel, at the Tower of Babel. But the other idea behind those words, whose top unto heaven, not just that the top was like the heavens, but also the top of the tower, they believed would lead them to heaven. They thought that this tower, that this religion that they practiced at the new tower would take them to heaven. It would bring to them a salvation. Remember the Bible speaks of the way of Cain. So right from the very beginning, just after the fall, right from the beginning of time, man has had his own way. Man has had his own ideas about salvation and how to get to heaven. You might say to us this evening, I have my way, I have my religion. And I'm sure that you have. There are multitudes, there are millions like you across the earth tonight. But the vital question, men and women, is, will it get you to heaven? It's not a hope so. It's not a might. Remember how vital, how urgent, how serious this matter is? Will your religion get you to heaven? Will it save your soul? Remember the warning of Solomon repeated twice in the book of Proverbs. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So I want to warn you, men and women, there's only one way to heaven, and it's God's way. It's the way of the cross. It's by Jesus Christ. It's by trusting in Him, putting your trust alone and completely in His sacrifice, uh, the sacrifice that He made, the sacrifice that He finished and completed when He died on Calvary's cross. It's interesting, the name Babel, before God judged the place, it meant the gate of God. You see, they believed that this tower, this religion, was the gate to God. It was the way to heaven. And let me point out as well that ancient secular history records that Nimrod called himself Belos. That means the sun god. That's how Nimrod was worshipped in Babylon in, uh, later, in later ages. So Nimrod, like Nebuchadnezzar after him, he put up an idol, an idol of, of himself in this city and in this tower. He wanted to be a leader in religion. And even more than that, he wanted to be worshipped, and he wanted to be worshipped uh, as God. Let me remind you that the Bible teaches the same of the Antichrist. He too will want to be worshipped when he arises and when he's at the height of his power. Think of the great statement that's found in Revelation chapter 13. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names 
are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So that's his position. Nimrod's position, as it foreshadows the Antichrist, his position as a political and as a spiritual king. Notice as well his persecution. The Scriptures teach, in the days of Noah, the earth was filled with violence. And men and women, that will be a mark of uh, the end time age. The Savior said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And we can see that before our eyes. The earth again is filled with violence. I want to point out that one of the titles of Antichrist in the Scripture, I've mentioned one already, the King of Babylon, that's a study in itself. I, I, I highlighted for you two weeks ago Arthur Pink's a book on the Antichrist, a very valuable book, a very interesting study. He gives a chapter over to the titles of uh, the Antichrist. And another one of the titles of the Antichrist in Scripture is the violent man. Look for it. If you have uh, the sword or whatever, you'll be able to find it uh, quite easily. The violent man. It reveals he will be a leader in terrorism. And you know of many examples of that even in recent history, of terrorists, violent men in government. Think of Nelson Mandela. Think of Martin McGuinness, and so on. That Daniel says of the nations that God sets over them the basis of men. And we could say the basis of women as well. How very true that is, even as we think of events that are unfolding before us, even in our own land that at this time. John Calvin said, when God wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked rulers. It's not a solemn thought, men and women. As we think of our land and what's taking place, we're, we're experiencing something of the judgment of God upon this land of ours for its sin and for its wickedness. But I want you to see that the Antichrist is uh, the fulfillment of, of that name, that title. He's the greatest example of the violent man. He's the one who is also described in Psalm 5 as a bloody and deceitful man. He'll be a man of blood. And you have a, a very clear picture of that in this man, uh, Nimrod. Look at what we read of him in chapter 10. Look at verse 9. It says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Iraq and Akkad and Calne in the land of Shinar. So notice he was a mighty hunter. He may have hunted wild animals like dinosaurs. Perhaps that's how he became famous. Perhaps that's one reason why the dinosaurs became extinct. But hunting animals was common. It was common in those days, way back then. That's how people lived. That's one of the ways that they fed themselves. But what is being spoken of here, men and women, is extraordinary. It sets this man apart. This verse is more a reference to his hunting of people than it is to his hunting of animals. It's interesting. D. Witt Talmadge, the American preacher, uh, Dr. Cook, uh, was always very interested in Talmadge's sermons. He has, a, he has a sermon on that verse. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and he draws it out on the subject of a soul winning. But Nimrod was hunting souls, all right. He was hunting the souls of men, but not hunting the souls of men for God. Nimrod was hunting souls for his new religion, and Nimrod did it using ruthless and brutal means. You think of a hunter. The words that are described here, they're used deliberately. He pursued men to support his religious movement as a hunter would pursue the prey. He sought to ensnare them, to catch them in Babylon. And if you didn't follow his religion, you were slaughtered just like an animal. And men and women, that's what the Bible tells us, exactly what Antichrist will be like, what he will do during that awful reign of terror that will be his 
at the very time of the end. That's especially what he will do to those who will not submit to him and to his new religion. Again, Revelation 13. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Notice the words, written of Antichrist, the beast, as his title is there in that 13th chapter of Revelation. He's going to make war with the saints, and he's going to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Remember that evil trinity I mentioned? Think of the false prophet, what the book of the Revelation says about him. He's going to promote uh, the Antichrist plans. Uh, and to those who won't take the mark of the beast, we're told that he will cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should uh, be killed. Those are fearful uh, truths. That's a fearful prospect, uh, men and women. Think as well of what we're told about Babylon, the city of the Antichrist, the city that he will rule over. Revelation 18, it says, In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon uh, the earth. That's a stupendous statement. It's a very staggering statement. In her was found the blood of prophets. Remember what I explained to you a little earlier? That cannot be said of Rome. It can be said of Babylon as the mother of harlots. The fact that all religion to this day can be traced back uh, to Babylon. So in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that was slain upon uh, the earth. You think of the great multitude that no man could number that will be put to death in the great tribulation period, all slain under the hand of Antichrist. So it's clear, men and women, he'll be a man of blood. He will be a man of violence. No one will ever persecute the people of God like uh, the Antichrist. Notice the words carefully that are recorded of Nimrod there in verse 8 of chapter 10. It says toward the end of the verse, he began to be a mighty one in uh, the earth. The, the idea there is as if a change took place in his conduct. At first, he sought to establish his power by peaceful and diplomatic means, but later he started to promote his purposes in a more forceful uh, manner. You, you think of what it says, that he began to be a mighty one in the earth. And that's exactly what Antichrist will do. Daniel tells us, In his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So at first, when the Antichrist comes, he will come by peaceful means. He's going to make a peace treaty uh, with the nation of Israel. He's going to make a covenant with them. You read of that in Daniel chapter 9, and all that we're told about the 70 weeks, and then halfway through that final week, the 70th week that Daniel speaks of, uh, he will break that treaty, and that's when he will start to exert his might. That's when his reign of violence, his reign of persecution, and his reign of terror uh, will uh, commence. So that's something, men and women, about his persecution. The final thing I'll emphasize is his punishment. Uh, Genesis 11, verse 7. The Lord says, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's uh, speech. Notice, go to, let us go down, the Lord says. Remember that the Lord destroyed Nimrod's plans. The Lord come down from heaven. This was divine intervention. And when God came down at that time in divine intervention, God judged Nimrod, his kingdom, and his religion. And so it will be, men and women, at the end. Remember one day, the Savior, the Lord Jesus, is going to come. He's coming again. He's going to return. He's going to come down again to earth uh, from heaven. And the second coming of Christ, men and women, the blessed hope of the church, that will be the greatest act of divine intervention that this world will ever see and this world will ever 
uh, experience. What will he do when he comes? Well, listen to Paul's words. I read them to you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That wicked shall be revealed. That's the Antichrist, the person of the Antichrist, and he will destroy him. The Lord Jesus will destroy him, the Bible says, with the brightness of his coming. Think of Zechariah 14. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem uh, to battle. And remember, they're going to be led in that final attack, those armies. They're going to be led in their attack by the Antichrist. But what will happen at that time? What will happen at that moment? Well, Zechariah tells us, then, the, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. What will happen, men and women, is this. The Lord will come down, as he did away back then at Babel. The Lord will come down again. But that, this time or that time, at the time of the end, he will come to defend Jerusalem, and he will come to destroy her enemies and the leader of their enemies, even the Antichrist himself. I can remind you, men and women, if you die without Christ, how solemn, how fearful that will be. If you die unsaved, you're going to be with the Antichrist in eternity. The saved will be with Christ. He said he's coming to take us to be with himself so that where I am, there ye may be also. So the saved will be with Christ for all eternity. But the unsaved, they will spend eternity with the Antichrist. The book of the Revelation, chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them. What's going to be the end of the devil? The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast, remember that's the title of the Antichrist, and the false prophet, there's the evil trinity. The beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So there's the evil trinity. And they're all in the lake of fire. Can I ask you tonight, men and women, is that where you're going? Is that where you want to go? Is that who you're going to be with in eternity? Is that who you want to be with in eternity or for all eternity? Remember, those whose names are not found written in the book of life shall be cast into that same lake of fire. Can I remind you that in eternity that you're either with God's Christ or the devil's Christ. So which will it be? Which will it be for you? Here then are some foreshadowings, men and women, of the Antichrist that are found in the life of Nimrod. Something of what his life, his character, teaches us about the Antichrist, the final great leader of one of the Gentile uh, empires. And he's especially a, a type of man that the Antichrist will be. We see that in his personality, his power, his position, his persecution, and his punishment. I'll conclude just with highlighting this thought. I point out we have been looking particularly at Genesis 10 and 11, the first two chapters in the Bible about Babel or Babylon. But in the next chapter, Genesis 12, you have the call of Abraham. And God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, or God called, if you like, Abraham out of Babylon. And that's just how it's going to be at the time of the end as well. That same call will go forth. That same call will take place. And there will be those that will respond to that call. Some of God's people at the time of the end will be called out of Babylon as well. Revelation 18, think of the words, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her plagues. But think of not just where Abraham was called out of, but think of where he was called to. 
because he was called to the land, called to the land of Canaan, called to the land of Israel. And at the time of the end, men and women, after the destruction of Antichrist, Israel's going to be called to that same land. It will then, as never before, be the promised land. Why will it be then, as never before, the land of promise? Well, because then every promise that God has given to Israel concerning the land and concerning possessing the land, it will be completely, totally, finally, permanently fulfilled. So what a prospect that is, men and women. What a prospect. And what an encouraging truth that is for us to conclude uh, this study and this message upon uh, tonight. We'll sing together, please, 256 or two verses of 256. Where will you spend eternity? This question comes to you and me. Tell me what shall your answer be? Where will you spend uh, eternity? 256, verses 1 and 4. Think of the, the appeal made in the fourth verse, turn and believe this very hour. Trust in the Saviour's grace and power. Then shall your joyous answer be saved throughout all eternity. So 256, 1 and 4, and we're standing to sing, please. close of the meeting. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for opportunity to study a little more of your word. Bless these truths that we have pondered. Lord, write them upon every heart we ask of thee. Think of the words that we have sung, where will you spend eternity? Lord, write that question upon the hearts of those in this meeting, listening to this service tonight, who are still out of Christ, and Lord, our cry, our burden, is that all might be able to say that they'll be saved uh, throughout all eternity. Save in this service. Lord, there's no uh, restraint, no limit to thee as to when and how you can save. Salvation is off the Lord. And Lord, our cry to thee tonight is that you'll come and save even in our midst. Save as a result of this service, even as it's sounded forth across the earth as well. Lord, hear our prayers. We commit ourselves to your care as we go from the house of God. And we ask that you'll spread your covering wings around till all our wanderings cease and until at our Father's love the boat, our souls arrive in peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.